directory. But the early source with Elena at the end of Daily Shachar is the mid 12th century manuscript of Moxer Vitry. So Vitry is a town in France. Okay, so we have this mid 12th century manuscript from France, it's northern France, right? And it has daily Elena in Shachar. And actually, it says, that you can see it, it says you say it balakash, you say it quiet. Okay, so unfortunately, this source does not say why we're saying it. Okay, so this is this is a big issue. We're, we're going to solve this problem. When we get to page 10, I'll, I'll give you some suggestions. But this is our starting point, that we have daily Elena in the 12th century France, and they're saying it silently. Now, this manuscript of Moxer Vitry is very interesting because if you remember, you know, the Birnbaum Moxers, remember they used to have the calendars in the back. So this 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 Moxer Vitry manuscript, which is the earliest Moxer Vitry, Master Victory Manuscript actually has a whole bunch of calendars attached to it. You know, many pages are missing, many pages are ripped. But two scholars, you know, they decided to analyze all the cal calendrical material, and they concluded that, that the, all the calendar material suggests that the manuscript itself dates from 1123 to 1154. They can't be more precise, but they're narrowing it down to 1123 to 1154. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you, but in a later research, that helps, actually, because something happened in 1171, which is in the materials, I don't know that we're really going to talk about, but something happened in 1171 in France, and people used to think that that 1171 event was what caused Daily Elena in France, but now we see that this manuscript, they were saying Daily Elena even before 1171, so we don't have to think about that 1171 event anymore. Okay. So now we're finished with France. Now we're going to go to Germany. Germany is, of course, next to France, which you know you'll see is significant. So in Germany, we have the source here on top of page two, Sidur Hasidei Ashkenaz, and what it is, it's a the prayer book of Rabbi Yehuda Hasid, and it was put together by his students. So you know he's a leading figure in Hasidei Ashkenaz. He died in 1217, and again we're talking now about Germany. So. If you read on the top, uh, he actually gives a reason. So there's daily Elena in this sitter, and mo most of what's written here probably is by Rabbi Yehuda Hasid himself, and not just by a student. So let's assume it's by Rabbi Yehuda Hasid himself. So he actually he actually gives the reason for daily Elena in his in his society. What does he say? He says because it has Askarat Hashem and Yichud Hashem. Okay, you see that that's at the top. So Askarat Hashem is very unclear. Um, I asked someone who's very, very knowledgeable in this period, you can guess who it is, and he told me he realized he didn't really, wasn't sure as to what uh, this meant, but he suggested to me that it meant that Elena had some gematria that alluded to God's name, or some kind of a letter pattern that alludes to God's name, but okay, but so that's not so important, but the real point is the next one, Yichur Hashem. So what is Yichur Hashem? See, Elena has the phrase in old, it also has so anod is like the idea of God's uniqueness or loneliness. So you see, so Elena has this idea. Now, the Hasidic Ashkenaz community, the idea of Yifkut Hashem was very important to them. What do I mean by that? Like if you open up the Rosh Hashanah Matzah and the Yom Kippur Matzah, what we recite in Yom, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we write, recite something called Shio Hayifud, right? But, but we're only reciting it on the high holidays, but this is a prayer that was written in their society to be written, to be recited every day. And it was either written by Rabbi Huda Hasid or his father or someone close to them. So in the society of Hasidic Ashkenaz in Germany, they would recite Shir HaYichud every day. So Rabbi Huda Hasid is saying here, well, you know, Aleo has these Yichud ideas. So therefore, we're going we're gonna to recite every day. Now, if you really wanted to understand what, you know, what she... Uh, Yichud Hashem means you have to read through uh, the Shira Yichud. It's very long, and you know, you can look at all the ideas. But for our purposes, we we can understand how this community of Chassidim Ashkenaz who focus on the idea of Yichud Hashem, we can understand that they might have taken Aleinu and brought it into the daily service. But the truth is, the truth is, really, what really happened? You see, got to be a little suspicious here. You see, Germany is right next to France, so if we see this thing. Daily Elena with France, and then a few decades later, it's saying in Germany. What's really going on is that the, the Minha from France spread to Germany. I mean, that's, you, know, you can't prove it 100%, but that's you know, 98% of what happened here. And then what Rabbi Huda Hasid was doing, he's just trying to legitimize 
uh, the custom in the eyes of his own community and strengthen it. But that's what's going on. And, and the way to, to prove this is you know, in France, we said they were saying it balachash, they were saying it quietly. And if you look at the Ropeach on page two, which is um, it's kind of towards the middle of the page, the Ropeach was a student of Rabbi Huda Hasid. He says they said Aleinu, kol yachid v'yachid. And that probably means, that's another way of saying balachash. The reason I'm suggesting this is because elsewhere, the, Ro, the Ropeach, and not on the, it's not on the sheet, but elsewhere, when he talks about Shabbos Aleinu, he says they said it balachash. So that kol yachid v'yachid thing probably is another way of saying balachash. So, you know, if in France they're saying it balachash, and then in Germany they're saying it balachash, you know, it seems like it's really the French, the French minhag which spread to Germany, not that in Germany they suddenly, you know, it's exempted this on their own. Okay. So we're finished with France and Germany. Now we're going to go to England. You know, by the way, you know, you'll be able to ask questions at the end, but, you know, we're, let, we're letting me go through this while you're all being mute. Okay. So now we'll, uh, we'll talk about England. So on page three, this is another sitter which has daily Aleinu. And this one, you know, they, um, the binding suggested is from England, okay? And um, basically, this sitter is, is unique because it has two blank pages at the end, right? And a Sephardic businessman went to England, and he wrote down, he, he was a money lender, and he collected money from people in England, and he wrote down on the two blank pages, he wrote down the payments that he got. Okay, he wrote them in, in Judeo-Arabic. So, you know, it's Hebrew letters, but, the, but it's Arabic language. But the point is that the people that he got money from were, were all important people. Or some of them were important people. And, you know, some scholars said, hey, let's go and analyze the records of medieval England, and we can figure out who these people are, and then we can date the sitter. So one of the payments he got was from someone named William Shemele. If you look on line seven you know, in, the, in the Hebrew the text there, right? His name was in Guliam Shumla, right? And they figured out that this Guliam Shumla, he died in 1202. And, you know, certainly the payment was not from the state. It was really from a live person. So this sitter, which has a uh, daily Elena with the end of Shabbat, it's, we see that it's dated to uh, prior to 1202. Okay, so that's just, you know, an interesting digression. And in general, you know, the Minhagim of England come from France. So the sitter apparently has the Nusra of Shila of France. Okay. So now we've done, you know, England, uh, France, and Germany. Now we're going to go to a different region. Let's turn to page four. Page four, we're going, and now I want to discuss like Egypt and Israel. Page four on the bottom, we got something from the Cairo Giza. Now what that means, we found, they found like, you know, Siddur from the 11th, 12th century. You know, most of the things from the Giza are from the 11th, 12th, 13th century. So they found some Siddur in the Cairo Giza, and it has a text of Tilat Shahri. And in general, the text of this sitter has like an Eretz Yisrael text. Okay, so we have an Eretz Yisrael text of Tefillah Shachar. Okay, and um, it's from, you know, you know, 11th, 12th, 13th century. And it doesn't matter the precise date. So what happens in this, in this text? If you look towards the bottom, they summarize what's in the text. With four lines in the bottom, they tell you that this is a Tefillah Shachar and it has a Tzuke de Zimra. And what do we find in the middle of Tzuke de Zimra? We find Aleinu. Okay, so this is very interesting. You know, and it was in this Minhag of Eretz Israel from, you know, the 11th, 12th century, they were citing, were citing Aleinu in the middle of Tzuke de Zimra. So this, of course, made no sense to me. And then I was walking with my friend Rabbi Moshe Yasser many years ago, and I told this to him, and he paused for six seconds, and he said, you know, what's the word after Aleinu? The Shabbat. So it fits perfectly because Baruch Amar is Tishbachot, Shabbat is Tishbachot, is Tishbachot. So Elena the Shabbat is a perfect fit for Psuke de Zimra. Okay. Despite all our, you know, modern uh, wrong intuitions today. Okay. And now I have something else very interesting on this page um, at the top. See, there's a work called Kirti de Rabbi Eliezer, which is from Israel, let's say from the 8th century. And there's a certain passage there that one of the show some some of them we show them quote a certain passage from Kirk and Rebelezer. That this passage is not in our text of Kirk and Rebelezer, but let, let's assume, let's assume that it was there originally. So if you look on the top, on the top of page four, top left, so there's a passage, the statement in Kirk and Rebelezer that Elena was so important, You have to say it standing. 
now. The question is, what arena are they talking about? Because we're now, you know, in, let's say we're in 8th century Israel. They weren't saying daily Elena was the end of Shabbos, right? So what arena could they be referring to? So they're not talking about the Amida because you know, the, the Amida of Rosh Hashanah because you're standing for the Amida, right? And they're not talking about Hazar Rashat because it's talking about something you have to say standing. So I want to suggest, I mean, this is just a suggestion, but that maybe this Suke de Zimmerman has is what's reflected here. In other words, we have this statement about Elenu in the 8th century in Turkey of Eleazar, which makes no sense. So maybe we can link it up with, um, you know, with the custom that we found in the later, in the later period that they were saying Elenu in uh, Suke de Zimmerman. But that's just a suggestion. You don't have to accept this, but then, you know, then you still got to explain this weird statement in Turkey of Eleazar. Okay. Now, let us go to page five. So page five, I'm going to explain to you the role of um, Elenu in, on Rosh Hashanah. And this is from the Art Scroll Master. So yeah, you should recognize this. So, you know, on the top, we have the second, on the top, it's quoting from Alkane Nakaba. So let's, let's read, how does, I'm going to explain to you how Alkane Nakaba leads into the 10 Malchio verses. Okay, the uh, Kablu Kulam et Ol Machutecha, the Timlach Alam may rally along by it, Ki Hamachut Shalchahi or Mayad Timloch Bechavod. So we have four Melech words and then they proceed to do the 10 verses. So this is like a perfect leading to Malchias, you know, four, Malch four Malchias words and then, and then you have the 10 you know, Malchias uh, verses. So, uh, okay, all right. So, you know, to me, this, this shows that Alkane Nakava was, was, you know, was written as an intro to the Malchus verses. I mean, you can't, you can't really do, do better than this, okay? Now, what's interesting, you know, if, if, if you paying attention carefully, here, so you see yeah. that um, Rosh Hashanah, we have basically, the Rosh Hashanah has, has 10 Malchus verses, but what do we do in the daily davening? We, not, we add verse 1 and verse 9. In other words, yeah, on the first page in Mokshar Victory in France, when they adopted Elena into the daily service, they didn't have any verses, okay? So uh, so they didn't have any verses. They only went up to Atemot uh, Bechavod. And on page two, the Rokeach in Germany, it's the same thing. They only went up to Atemot uh, Bechavod. But over time, like, so today we say that first verse and we say the ninth verse. So how did, how did this happen? So regarding the first verse, that one seems to have been added pretty quickly. Mm. I, I think it was added <clears throat> based on a gematria. I don't really want to discuss it further, but I, but I think that's what happened. But the ninth verse, you know, I mean, I, I'm always wondering why, why don't we have verses one and nine? Why is there such a discount, discontinuity? So the answer is they get added to different stages. So, all right, so the first verse was added, you know, pretty shortly, you know, um, I think it's already in, uh, it's already in the, the one with the English payment notations, where it has, has this uh, right? But the verse from Zechariah, the Namar, that I think was not added until like the time of the Ari, you know, several hundred years later. We have to double check that. You know, there's a new book coming out I'm going to talk about in a minute by Professor Ruben Kittleman. So we have to check what he says there. But I think, I think that's what he says there that, that our famous the Namar verse was not added till the time of the Ari. Okay. Now we're going to go to page six. Now we're going to talk about who wrote Elenu, you know, which hopefully you've been wondering about for a long time. Okay. So it, um, you don't have to, you can trust me that if you go to page two, you have Rabbi Yehuda Chassid saying right at the beginning that Yehoshua wrote Elenu. Okay. So, and this, he was widely quoted by everybody who came after him. Now, but before I, before I uh, finish my thoughts here, I want to just mention one other thing. In the arts called Sitter, it says that High Gaon says Yehoshua wrote Elenu, and High Gaon is, you know, is before Rabbi Yehuda Hasid. But that High Gaon reference, that's a mistake. Like, like there's a, there's a chuba by of High Gaon, but the idea that Yehoshua wrote Elenu, that's like a, a later addition to the chuba, was not in the original chuba. So you just forget that, you know, you know cross out the line on the art store, whatever, put the asterisk, whatever. Okay, all right. But we're talking now about Rabbi Yehuda Hasid. So he definitely said Yehoshua wrote Elenu. And everybody copied him afterwards. They quote him. But you see, he doesn't say we had a Masora that Yoshua wrote away. All he meant was, in my opinion, Yoshua wrote, wrote away. And that's all he He didn't say it in my opinion, but that's what he meant. He didn't have a Masora. Okay. But 
the truth is, anybody who, who looks at the vocabulary of Alenu will realize that it has the vocabulary of the Tana Itic and Amoraic period. So, for example, let's I wrote let's read something that I wrote here. Um, the last paragraph in English on page page six. There is much evidence that Alenu could not have been composed by Yoshua. For example, Alenu cites verses from the prophet Yeshaya. Two. Uh, the phrase HaKadosh Baruch Hu was not an appellation for God in biblical time. Three, terms are found in, in Aleinu that are characteristic of Hechalot literature. And what does that mean? We're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but Hechalot literature is to say generally from the Tanaitic and Amoraic period. And what terms am I referring to? The terms like Moshe Yekarol, Shtinat Uzo, Gavhe Miromim, these are like mystical terms with you know combined two two ideas combined in one so this is the hebrew of the you know the tanaitic and amoraic memory period it's not the hebrew of the time of yoshua and finally it's not until uh the book of daniel and perhaps kohelet that olam means world usually in tanakh from the 90 percent of tanakh olam as a time means so you know elena has the takain olam the olam means world so you see, that's not the language of, of the time of the Yeshua. It's, it's much later, much later. Okay. So once we, uh, you know, we're going to reject the Yeshua idea, but now I'm going to tell you a reasonable solution is that Elena dates from the time was written by Rav. You know, Rav, Rav, who argued with Shmuel all the time. And Rav lived in the third century CE. Now, Rav has an interesting biography because he started off in Israel, then he ended up in Babylonia. You know, after I finish uh, my argument that, that Elena was written by Rav, you know, then you're going to wonder, well, did Rav know any Christians, right? So that would be an interesting follow-up question. So I'm going to say right now, I don't know the answer to that question, but I will say that there is someone who writes a column in the Jewish Lincoln right next to mine, and he loves to write about the biographies of the Tanaim and the Moram. So we have to get him interested in this question. And then he can analyze the biography of Rav and figure out exactly where Rav lived in Israel and then exactly where he lived in Babylonia. And then, you know, we figure out whether there were Christians in those areas. Okay. But now let me explain the case for um, Rav writing Elena. So you know, you're supposed to understand by now that Elena is the introduction to mm. the Mafia. The introduction to the 10 Mafia verses. I'm going to call it the introduction to Mafia. So the Gemara, whether it's Mafia or the Ushami, do not mention the introduction to Mafia. However, the Talmud Yerushalmi, in two places, mentions the introduction to Zephronos. Okay, so now, let's look on the bottom, we're on the bottom of page six, and let's look at the passage on the left, which is from the Talmud Yerushalmi, Rosh Hashanah. Third line, as it is written in the Tkiyasa of Rav, and now they can quote from Zephronos, they quote like 36 words, which match what we have today. So I think they quote, I think this amount, I didn't really count, but it's like 15 to 20 percent of what we have today. And this matches what we have today. Now, you see, we have to understand what does the word piyasa mean, right? It does, they didn't say the zakronos of Rav, they, it's, they said something broader. They said the, all three introductions of Rav. And the piyasa means the Rosh Hashanah Pia of Rav, okay? So what they're saying is Rav wrote the three intros. That's like 99%. That's what that phrase means. That the kiyasa of Rav, kiyasa means all three intros together. Okay. Now, but they're only quoting from the intro to Zephronos. So you have to, to get the conclusion that Rav wrote Elenu, you just have to make two assumptions, which I think are reasonable. The first one is well, we see that they, they had Zephronos about 15% of what we have today. But I think it's reasonable to conclude that the rest of the Zephronos match what we have today. Again, we can't be sure, but you know, I, I think that's a reasonable assumption. Then once you make that assumption, then well, if their Zephronos was the same, then probably their Malchus was the same too. So that's so that's basically the argument. And you know, I, I think I think that the Zephronos, Malchus, and Shofar kind of complement one another, meaning like. There's a plan to it. Like they sound like this mix and match. You know, in other words, if if their zakonas was entirely the same, and then that means that that it was the same mafias that we have today too. So that's basically the argument. You just got to make these two reasonable assumptions that uh, they probably have the same zakonas as us, and if they have the same zakonas as us, then they have the and they have the same intro uh, to mafias as well. You know, when I say zakonas, I mean intro to zakonas. 
Okay, so, so this is uh, basically the argument. Okay, but now, oh, by the way, I only just mentioned that the passage on the right, it has a slightly different Gersa, uh, in a different passage of Shalom, it says, Piyasa de Beira, the, the Rosh son of Pia, of the base Medrash of Ra. But really, when, if you look at that figure, they're also saying, they're also assuming that Ra wrote the Piyasa, so the difference in the Gersa is not significant. Now, there's that, the, the passage on the right is, is assuming that Ra wrote the Piyasa, so, you know, it's not just talking about the general base Medrash of Ra. Okay. Now, now I'm going to mention um, the new book by Professor uh, Ruben Kaleman. He's been working on this book on the daily liturgy, you know, for many, many, many years. So, you know, he's a professor of liturgy at Brandeis, and he's an Orthodox rabbi as well. So his book uh, should be out in a few months. It's called The Rhetoric of the Jewish Liturgy. And it has a chapter on Matovo, Adon Alam, Ashray, Zikin Zimra, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he also has a chapter on Elaine. So I don't, I don't think uh, this is top secret. I'm going to say what he says in, uh, in his book. Okay. So he's going to disagree with me because he's going to say Elaine was a little later than Rob. And this is his argument. He finds an Aramaic piet from the fourth century, right? An Aramaic piet from the fourth century by a Samaritan poet. Okay. And and it begins, Havlan Mishabcha, let us give Shevach. Let us give Shabbat to the master of the world. So this is very similar to Elena Shabbat Ladon HaKol. It's slightly different, but you know, mostly the same. And then he wants to say that, well, maybe uh, our Elena is after this Aramaic one. But, you know, again, this is just conjecture. No one really knows. But it is interesting that there is such an Aramaic piet by Samaritan. That's interesting, too. That, that begins, Havlan Mishabcha Lamara Da'alma. But, you know, the conjecture which one uh, came first I and mean, that's that's just conjecture okay we'll talk more about the Kimmelman book you know you definitely have to get the Kimmelman book it's a Littman library book you know tons of footnotes on all the daily diving and answer all your questions on all on all prayer okay now we're going to go to page seven okay and now, you know, I told you I was going to eventually discuss whether Elena was written for Rosh Hashanah or perhaps uh, written for a different context and then, and then taken into Rosh Hashanah. So, and I showed you before on page five that I, to me it's clear that, that Alkane Nakata was written as an introduction to Rosh Hashanah because it had all those Melech words, had four Melech words, and then came the ten Malkins verses. I mean, that's, you know, that's pretty good. But I'm going to, here in this page, I'm going to... Uh, mention the view of somebody else uh, who, who takes the opposite view. Okay, I'm giving his name a shot. Okay, so we have to do now, just have to talk about Hey Hello Literature for a minute. Hey Hello Literature is a mystical literature from the Tanaitic and Amoraic periods, and it often features Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael. And it's a pseudopographic literature, which means these are not real stories about Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael. Okay. So we're on page six. Now look in the middle where it says longer recension. So what do we have in this longer recension? We have Alenu in the singular. So let's read a little bit. The, the longer recension, you know, Alai the Shabbat, Shalosam Chelki, the Gorali, Vanimit Palel. So what what is this prayer in the context? In the context, you know, again, this is a mystical literature. So this is a prayer of gratitude recited by Rabbi Akiva on return from a journey to heaven. Okay, prayer of gratitude recited by Rabbi Akiva on a return from a journey to heaven. Now, Professor Meir Barilan, who's very brilliant in general, and he's a descendant of the Mitziv, he thinks Elena was taken from here or from somewhere else in this Kehalot literature and then barred into the Rosh Hashanah literature. So why does he say this? He has two general general arguments. He says that in general, texts go from this special literature into regular liturgy and not vice versa. And secondly, he says that in general, texts that are singular are earlier than the ones that are plural. So he thinks, you know, Elena was taken from this literature and went into the regular literature, and then it was just went from singular to the plural. 
Then also, I just want to, this is very clever. So let's look at the bottom of page seven, uh, the last three lines, just to, just to listen to his argument. Uh, so the last three lines of page seven, he says, if the author of Elenu, if he was writing his tefillah from Malta, right, then how would he, what would he have said? He would have said, Elenu l'shabeach l'melech ha'olam, l'kekedula l'moshe al-bakol, v'anachnu mamlichem. So, you know, he, he's making interesting suggestions here. Okay. Um, but the point is that he he realizes that the Allah the Shabbat prayer does not make sense in that context, uh, you know, the prayer returning from heaven. So he realizes that. So that's why he suggests, well, maybe it really comes from a different part of Hey Hello literature. But we don't have any other evidence for it in Hey Hello literature. So, you know, I gave him a shot, but, his, his, you know, he, he's not going to, he doesn't win this argument in my mind, you know. So that's all, but at least I gave him a shot. Okay. Now let's go to page eight. Okay, so now this is all very, this is all very important. Okay. All right. Okay. A major issue in Elena research is Elena and Alkane Nakava were both paragraphs written at the same time. So I think the answer is yes. Because if you look at the bottom of the sheet, you see that both sites the same chapter from Isaiah, chapter 45. So let's look at the bottom, on the bottom of page eight. You see verse 20 has the phrase, mitpalim el el lo yoshia, right? That's within the first paragraph of Leno. And that, if that's 100%, that was the original, in the original text of Leno. So it has, that's from the first paragraph of Leno, mitpalim el el lo yoshia. And on the end of 23, kili tefra kobera And that, you know, that was adapted into the second paragraph of Leno. So in other words, we have two paragraphs of Elena, and they're both signed from the same chapter of Yeshaya. So sure, it's possible that a later author of the second paragraph started to cite from the first, from the same uh, chapter that the, that the author of the first paragraph was, but, but that's the lesser likely of alternative. You know, Elena was not a long prayer. So, you know, a prayer can have more than one theme, right? In the present, we do this, and in the future, we do that. That's not such a complex idea that, you know, someone can author a prayer, one person can author a prayer with two ideas. In the present, we do this. In the future, we do that. Okay. Now, I will say that, you know, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, in his Siddur commentary, he says, well, they had different authors, but together, they go very well. So, you know, together, they go very well. You know, that really suggests that really maybe they really were written at the same time. Don't worry, I'm going to agree with Rabbi Sachs uh, soon, uh, so just don't worry, I'm going to agree with him very soon. Okay, so now we're, let's go to the, the uh, top of page eight. So I, I'm going to agree with him on, on a different matter, so that's what I want to say. Okay, the top of page eight, this is uh, exceptionally important. The road Meherat is Tiberet Uzeha. So the question is, what does Tiberet Uzeha mean? So what it really means, it's a poetic way of saying, Beis Hamikdash. That's what Tiber Uzecha means. You know, I, I wish I, get, I wish if this was live. I'd, I'd ask everybody to raise their hands. I'm curious if, any, if people really knew this before. You know. So, but anyway, so you could send it to the chat if you knew this before. I want to see how many, you know, how many of you knew this before. Okay. So, you know, and right before it is, there's the word Mehera. Right? See, so is this suggestion 100 percent? To me, this is 110 percent because of that Mehera word. Okay. The road Mehera the Tiber Uzecha. Now, this is not my idea. This is, the Abudraham says it, and he's not the first to say it. people said it before him. But you know, the way it, the way life works, you know, in America, like if something doesn't make it into the art scroll, then it's, then it's little known. So, okay, so I, now I cited, I cited many verses to support the idea that Tifer Uzecha is an allusion to the base of Mikdash. You should add, you should add, uh, this is not on the sheet, you should add Echa to one, has the word Tiferet, and look at the dot mikra there. Again, Echa, chapter two, verse one, look at the dot mikra. I'm just gonna read out, I'm gonna read one of the one of the things I'll say here. Oz the Tiferet the Mikta show. That's from Tehillim 96. Oz the Tiferet the Mikta show. You know, on a Shabbos we sing a song in Sur Mishalov, Zvul Beit Tifartenu. So again, it, it's all over the place. You know, Oz and Tiferet, 
this new space of Migash, you know, and the author of Avalanum, he wanted to, 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 to phrase his, uh, his request in a more, you know, high level, that's all. So that's why he, in a poetic way, but, you know, everybody misunderstood it for years. Okay, centuries. All right. Now, okay, now we're going to go to, uh, you know, my favorite topic, right? Uh, which is uh, Sikhan Olam, the Sakhain Olam. Okay, so many years ago, I wrote an article in Khatira where I explained that the real Girsa in Alenu is like the Sakhain Olam with a cusp, and it means to establish the world under the sovereignty of God. Okay, that's the, that, that's the real Girsa. Okay, and I just, uh, let, I would just tell, tell you very briefly uh, what happened here. So, you know, Many years ago, uh, my friend Yechia Levi came to show with, with his Taimani Matsar, and I saw that he had a cuff reading. And then um, I knew that Rav Sadia had the cuff reading. And then I realized, oh, you know, this is really interesting. He changed the whole meaning. And then, and then basically, I, then I looked at the Rambam, but in the standard Rambam, unfortunately, it's, see, Rambam did not say um, Aleno daily, but he did say in Rosh Hashanah. So if you look in the standard Rambam in the Torah, there is a Nuskhat Fila you know, of Rosh Hashanah, but it had Bahule, too many Bahule, so no one knew what the Ramos Girsa was. So, but basically then, you know, now they do all these good Rambams, and, you know, you see that uh, the people who do the good Rambams, you know, they all write that Rambam had it with a cuff. And then I did research on the Kairogniza, you know, uh, from my home, um, with the site, Geniza Org, you can look at all the Geniza fragments. So basically what I want to say is, you know, when I wrote my article in Khatira, I only had a few Geniza fragments to support me, but then in my later work, um, in Farm Blog and the one in my Esther on Math book, so then I then I you know I, I had many more Geniza fragments. So I, so in the Kara Geniza, you know, I looked at the Geniza fragments, you know, 19 of them had it with a cuff, one had it with a cuff, and one there was like a horizontal bar, and I couldn't tell whether it was a cuff or a cuff. But basically, okay, so, you know, I did all this research. I, I don't have time to really go into it, but um, the point is that there's a, there's enough evidence to show that the cuff was the original reading. And, and anybody who you explain this to, they all agree that contextually uh, the cuff reading makes more sense. Elena has nothing to do with social justice or improving things. It's talking about establishing a world under the sovereignty of God. And by the way, it's also important to point out that even if the reading was with a cuff, even if the reading was with a cuff, um, cuff had the meaning of establishing too. One of the it's one of its meanings. If you look at Jasper on page sixteen ninety two, you know he mentions establish as one of the meanings uh, of tikkun with a cuff. But even but even aside from that, I mean I think the original reading really was with a cuff. And what happened is there's this phrase tikkun ha. Tikkun HaOlam with a Kuf, which is 13 times the Mishnah, 70 times in, in, in the Bavli, et cetera, et cetera. So because of the common phrase, Tikkun HaOlam with a Kuf, some of that, that Kuf in Elena eventually got, you know, evolved in, into the Kuf. All right. Now, oh, we're, do, we're doing well here. Okay. Now we're up to page 10. Now, this is all very important. And I hear, you know, uh, this, you know people are close to it admit their errors before Rosh Hashanah, so I'm time for me to admit my error here. Okay, so when I wrote about, um, when I wrote about the Sakain, you know, in Hakira and Farm Blog and my Esther on Math book, I assumed, like most of us, that it was the Jewish people who were supposed to do the Latake. But only a few years ago, I realized that it's really God who's supposed to do the Latake. Here, I'm quoting Rabbi Sachs and Dr. Gerald Blitzstein, and they thought about this a long time, and, and they both agree that it's God who's doing the Latake, okay? And, you know, uh, my friend Rabbi Benji Yablok, he pointed out to me, we say, we're waiting for you, God. Okay, so, so you see now, you know, if Rav wrote Aleno in the third century, so basically, it's taken us like 1,800 years now we know how to spell Lutakein Olam, and now we finally understand who, who was the one who was doing it. Okay, now, now let's go to the bottom of page 10. Um, now we're going to answer the question that I raised at the beginning of this year. So we mentioned that Elena in France, they said they were saying it, uh, the Lahash, and we're trying to figure out 
why Elena entered the daily suffrage. So first, okay, there is a theory by Professor Tashma. I'm not going to go through it, but it is, it, I summarized it on the bottom of, of page, page 10 here, but he doesn't have enough evidence for his theory. So I'm going to take the, the other approach, which is what I, I'm going to read what I wrote here. In my view, and in the view of many others, Elena was likely introduced into the daily chakra as a prayer meant to express a rejection of Christianity. Probably its introduction came as a response to the Crusades of, of 1096, or due to the general feeling of downtroddenness that the Jews of France felt while living as second-class citizens in a Christian land. And, you know, and, that, and that's why it's the locus. They're not going to shout out you know, these ideas, so, okay? But that, that's, so that's what's going on here. And again, there's no question. There's no question that was that was in the original year. So. Now, um, you have to forgive me. I want to go to page 13. So so just let's look at page 13 because this kind of supports what, what I just said on, on page 10. Okay. So now, this is really interesting, okay? This is Elena with added anti-Christian language, okay? And the earliest source that we have this is from that sitter with the payment notations, which is dated from before 1202, okay? Now, let's look at it in the Hebrew. I underlined it all, all kinds of weird words here. You know, first we say, mitpalim le'elohishia, and then they say, adam, afar, dam, mara, basar, trucha, rima, tameim, tamal, Nothing, nothing, all kinds of craziness, right? So let's go to the English. Uh, some of this is by by uh, Ruth Langer. The intent of this insertion seems to be that other nations prostrate themselves to a man of ashes, blood, bile, flesh, rot, worms. This is a direct reference to Yeshu, emphasizes his base humanity, denying his resurrection. It asserts in graphic terms that his body gets composed, decomposed. Anyway, okay, so so we have this, you know. Severely anti Christian passage, and again, its earliest source is the one with the payment notation from before 1202. So, I wish we had an earlier source for this, right? Because I said that Elenu was in France in like 1120 to 1140s, or like 1120 to 1150s, right? But the truth is, you see, maybe, you know, those on page one, those scholars, you know, they just guesstimate, they, they gave an estimate of 30 years. Maybe instead of using the 1120 date, maybe. That that Mafsa Bridgie was from like 1150, and maybe the Cedar with the payment notations from England was from 1180. So so therefore, then our gap you know wouldn't be so great. In other words, between like 1150 and 1180, something like that. So but that's our situation. I mean, if, you know, to really prove that Elena was seen as an anti-Christian prayer, you know, in, you know before 1150, you know, you got to find some source from before 1150. But we don't have that. We have um, we have this source, you know, which is again sometime before 1202, but we don't know how much before 1202. Um, but then there are, there are other there are other sources with this language, but they're all, they're all later. Okay, there are other ones, but they're all later. So this is the earliest one that, uh, that I know. Okay, now, All right, we're, you know, we're nearing the end here, just a little more. Okay, so here, very briefly on page 11, we're going to talk about Sephardic sources uh, for our lane with the daily prayer. Just just very briefly, um, the tour, the tour lived, started off his life in uh, Germany, then he moved to Spain. So he says the Ashkenazim say it, and when he got to Spain, then he noticed the Spartans say Elena, daily Elena too. Okay, so he's, he lives in like central Spain, but then the Abu Draham, who lives in a different part of Spain, he's writing in 1340, he does not mention Aleno. Okay, so you see, so we have the tour writing in Spain, he does mention it, but the Abu Draham writing a different part in, in the same time does not mention it. And um, go to the Shulchan Aruch, um, you see on the bottom, the, uh, the Shulchan Aruch, Yosef Karo does not mention the Aleno, but the Ramah answers. So, you know, maybe, so basically I'm saying here that like the tour is the earliest source in, in, uh, in the Sephardic world which said Daniel Elena, you know, we have to check uh, Professor Kimmelman's book. It is possible that I missed something, but you know, great. I missed very little, okay. All right. Now we are up to page, uh, we're actually up to the page 12. Okay, page 12. Now, most of what I say here is not on the sheets, 
so you just so a flow slow and uh, just try to write it down. Okay. The topic now is Elena with daily mark and daily mecha. So Elena in um, daily mark, our earliest source is the Kolbo section 11, who cites Rabbi Meir of Rothenberg, who lived in Germany and died in 1293. Okay, so if you believe the Kolbo, right, actually he abbreviates, I think it's not, we're not sure, it's Rabbi Meir of Rothenberg, he writes Reish Mem, but usually they understand it's Rabbi Meir of Rothenberg. So, so Rabbi Meir of Rothenberg, who in Germany died in 1293, he already has a in daily Mara. And there's a slightly earlier source from Provence, it's called Minhag Marseille, that also has it in Mara. Okay. Now, the idea for Elena and Daily Mara developed because Elena was seen as a parallel to Shema, you know, because of the, the, a, a node. So once Elena was seen as a parallel to Shema, then it would make sense to say, to recite it in Mara. But in Mincha, there's no Shema, right? So, but it's very interesting, we do have a source in Mincha of Shabbos. Uh, there is one source that they were saying it as early as the 13th century. And what what's so special about Mincha of Shabbos? Because the Amir says Ata Echad. So so in early 13th century Provence, they decided to say Elenu at the end of uh, Mincha and Shabbos because because the Amir said Ata Echad, right? That means at the end of Echad. But as far as regular Mincha goes, you know, it, it, some people were saying it, but others were not. You know, it wasn't necessarily catching on. But then uh, someone asked the Rabbah, this is in the 1500s, 1500s in Egypt. And this is on the sheet, uh, it's on the top of uh, page 12. Uh, so someone asked the Rabbah this question. He said, look, you know, some people are saying it, Elena and Mincha, and other, other people are not saying it. What should I do? So the Rabbah gave a very interesting answer. He said, precisely because there's no Shema at Mincha, then we have to say, Elena and Mincha, right? He just turned the tables on the whole question. You know, we need to register this Yehud, this Yehud theme, you know, in, in this Tfila. So uh, if there's no Shema, then we should definitely say Elena. Okay. So basically, you know, I'm kind of nearing that here. So look, so, so Elena, for hundreds of years, it was seen as a Yehud prayer, right, parallel to Shema. But now it ends up in our times being seen as a Conclusory prayer, conclusion prayer, right? So on that note, I'm going to conclude my presentation, but I just want to mention a few more things. Um, one thing I did not discuss is how I later moved from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, so that you have to look at Professor Kimmler's book. Uh, two, on that the last, on page 12, it's very interesting, on the bottom of page 12, uh, there's a source called Seder Hayom, and I quote it because it talks about people saying Alenu seven times a day, and backwards as well. So that's very interesting to be done. Okay. Finally, regarding my new book, uh, I admit it does not discuss Elena, you know, but it has 62 interesting articles, such as on Rezavad Hashem Ori, Shalom Aleichem, on Miros, Malad Sur, Halach Ma'anya, and I have biographies of Rosh Baum, Judah Turo, Golden Air, and then 27 articles on interesting Hebrew words. So, you know, if you want to buy something, you can buy my, my if you want to buy a book on, with has my long Elena article, you should buy uh, the Esther and Math book, Esther and Math from 2015. Well, but otherwise, you can buy the new one, which, which is great as well. And of course, they're both by the same publisher. So, you know, he'll be happy either way. Okay, I am done. Shalom, I am done. Okay, well, this was excellent. And um, I, would like to see some questions in the chat. If you could just send them in the chat, this way I could collate them and address them to Mitch. I we had one question from before. Um, based on what you said about Shehem um, about Shehem Shachim Lahavel um do you believe that was the only? The only later insertion, and it's hard to understand what it says here. Was that oh, that's not a later insertion. That was there. That's in the original Elena. Sham Shachlin to have over a week. That's 100% was there originally. Uh huh. You know, you just have to look at the Siddur of Versailles. That, you know, for the look at our Siddur, Siddur of Versailles, he's died in 942. You know, that gives you a basic text of Elena. Okay. Um, Please, if you have other questions, just send them in the chat. 
because it's just it's very hard to control a crowd with so many pe people. So if you could just put them in the chat, that'd be great. Um, oh, somebody wants to know if you could repeat why we started to say Elena on Shabbos Mencha. Oh, because if you look at the, the Mencha Shmona Esrei, what is it? Just to open up or consider the Mencha of Shabbos Shmona Esrei. Ata Achad, Ushmo Achad, you know, and others. So it's all these Achad, it's Achad things. So that matches the Elenu, uh, the matches the Elenu, the, the Einod idea. It's only, it's only Mencha that has that, it's focused, only the Gemita of Shabbos Mencha that has the focus on the Achad thing. Okay, and um, do we know if Rav originally wrote it with anti-Christian messages? Yeah, well, that's what I'm, so that's what I was trying to say. In other words, now, if you if you agree that you know Rav is the person uh, is the correct answer, then the next step is to figure out what knowledge of Christianity Rav had. He lived in in Israel and in Babel, and you got to figure out exactly you know where in Israel he lived and where in Babel he lived. And he was a student of Rabbi Yerunati, so that, you know then you got to analyze where Rabbi Yerunasi lived and where the Christians lived in that time in Israel. I mean, I do, I remember reading that they do, they did have Christians in Babylonia in the third century, but exactly, you know, where they were and how many, you know, that, that's over my head. Okay, uh, and what's the name of the professor who wrote the book about the, the liturgy? Right. So, yeah, he's been working on for many years. Ruven Kimmelman, K-I-M-E-L-M-A-N. It's going to be a Littman Library book. So rhetoric, R H E T O R I C, the rhetoric of the Jewish liturgy. You know, he wrote so many liturgy articles. Now all his ideas will be in one place. You don't have to, you know, dig them out and read them separately, and you know, you put them into a book form. I'm sorry. Who wrote rhetoric of the Jewish liturgy? Ruben, Professor Ruben Kimmelman, K I M E L M A N. Okay, he, thank you. He's a he's a Orthodox rabbi and professor of liturgy at Brandeis. Uh huh. Um, also, somebody asked um, what you wrote a book about twenty years ago, twenty plus years ago. Um, I, I, my master's paper, yeah, my master's under Doctor Sidwan and. My master's paper was on the Persian period, was on Seder al Amraba. It has a weird chronology of the Persian period, a very short chronology, you know, very, very different than the secular history. You know, very, very briefly, three Persian kings in, in Seder al Amraba, where there were really 10 kings in 200 years in secular history. And so I wrote all about that. So, you know, that was my master's paper, then became published as a book uh, under the title Jewish History in Conflict. Was published by Jason Aronson, but they, you know they're out of business. But they're, they, you can buy it anyway because they, they sold all the, the rights to uh, uh, Roman and Littlefield, so it's available, but it's expensive. Can you explain um, how the Shema is a parallel to Aleinu? Well, you know, Shema, Shem Elkeinu, or Hashem Echad. So Aleinu had these gain old ideas and Ephesua. So, so you know, it's, it's like a, a rough parallel to Aleinu. And you know, for hundreds of years, you know, like in 11, 12, 13 hundreds, this was like, this was reflected in, in the liturgy. Okay, I mean, I don't, I don't remember the examples, but everybody understood, uh, everybody understood this parallel. I'm um, sorry to wrote great talk. I mean, everybody, everybody's saying that basically a great talk. If one recites Elena more often than required, does that constitute a violation of some kind? Or do the extra recitations bring additional merit to the person performing the extra recitations? Okay, that's too mm -hmm. that's too hard for me. But I did say I did on that last page of my handout. I did cite a, a you know like a mystical source in the 1500s where they sang it seven times and, and even backwards. So yeah. okay, um, I believe Rav Yehuda. Hanasi lived in Beit Sha'an, but mostly in Sipori. Rav was a Ben Bayit to, ra to Rabbi, Rabbi, and his uncle Rav Chia, and must have been exposed to Galilean early Christians. That's what I read. Uh, okay. Rebbe, Rebbe was, was a Ben Bayit to Rebbe and his uncle Rav Chia. Okay, okay, very good, all right. 
you know, this is, you know, early Christianity, that's, that's not my field. So uh, I, didn't, I never <laughs> you don't, imagined. You don't do early Christianity. <laughs> I, I never imagined there were Christians in Babylonia in the third century, but I, I saw something like Ruth Langer mentioned that there is such a concept. So, you know. Uh huh. Okay. Um, somebody was kind enough to post the uh, the Jewish liturgy book. So I'll, I, I think what I'll do is I'll just send that in an email because I'm having trouble with my mouse. Um, but thank you, Ari. Um, any other questions or comments? Again, it's nice to see everybody. And uh, I probably only have an idea of about a third of you because I only see about a third of the names here, but I uh, wish I could say hello to all of you, but okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, well, this, this, oh, wait, what? We have another question. I feel like we're on a game show. Um, on Rosh Hashanah, we don't have the anti Christian message. How is that? i sorry I said that. Is that true? We don't have the anti Christian message on Rosh Hashanah? No, well, okay, well, okay, then, you know, okay. I'll let, there is a, there's a text of Elena, right? So, see, the question, see, if I wrote Elena, we don't have to assume that he was writing it as an anti-Christian work, anti-Christian text. In other words, I'm just saying that in the 1100s in France, then they started thinking of it in this anti-Christian way. But I, I didn't say that, that Rob wrote it with an anti-Christian message, right? And that he's allowed to, he's, you know, he's quoting verses, of, verses from Messiah, but right? I mean, that's a verse from Yeshaya. So I'm not claiming Rob had an anti-Christian message. I mean, this is something that could be researched, but you know, I, I don't know enough about Rob to, to make that claim. So we're just reciting what, what Rob wrote. But all I was saying is that in you know, the daily liturgy in France in the 1100s, then it started uh, becoming understood as this anti-Christian prayer. Okay, um, what about the bowing of Anach Nukorim? Any idea where that started? Uh, right, let's think. Uh, I, I, I don't want to. It's, it's been a long time since I researched that, so I'm going to pass on that one. Okay, um, that's fair. Um, can you clarify why you think our Elenu preceded similar Hechalo texts? Why are Elenu preceded? Similar hechalo texts. I'm not sure what that what does that mean. Well, in other words, okay, okay. All right. You see, I think that the Alai Lishabeach in the story of Rabbi Akiva returning from heaven, it, it, it doesn't doesn't fit the context. So so that's they're stealing it from regular language. It's not it's not vice versa. So so that's that's what I think. This this was really very um, elucidating, and um, we we definitely would need another whole session to cover all the questions that people have and and to do more um, justice to this topic. But um, this was really great, and I'm really happy about the turnout. Um, this is the first of our series, so a nice turnout. And Mitch, I really appreciate your scholarship and you're willing to. Um, teach us a lot about Elena, especially since Rosh Hashanah is coming up. Um, so thank you so much for that. And thank you everybody for coming and have everybody have the Chasiva Chasima Tova. And so you thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And the truth is I really learned a tremendous amount from preparing. You know, even though, even though I knew like 90% of the stuff before, I learned a whole bunch of new things which were very helpful to me. Wow, that's 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 a lot. That's a pretty Amazing because you've done this topic um, numerous times, at least in writing, you know, if not in orally. So uh, that you learn it each time is, is incredible. Um, and everybody's saying a shakoach and thank you. And um, so you're welcome. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shalomis. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Okay, okay, thanks. Have a good night. And Shana Tava. Shana Tava. Bye bye.